singing Visi d'Arte from Puccini's Tosca. To mark the anniversary of Callas's death, the Hellenic Centre in London's Paddington Street is mounting a series of events through the month of October, including an exhibition of costumes, photographs and memorabilia called Maria Callas Remembered, and on the 15th, a commemorative concert featuring the Greek soprano Jenny Drivala. Callas and her contemporaries on the 21st is a presentation by the producer and broadcaster Alan Seawright, who knew Callas himself and who has lectured on her all over the world. Somebody once called Maria Callas a Greek sorceress. Yes, I suppose she's a national Greek treasure. She's certainly one of the most famous Greeks of the last hundred years. One has to clarify that because she was born on the island of Manhattan. Not in the Bronx, as some people like to say. No, she was born on a windy, rainy and stormy, snowy night. What I love is she used to think that she was born, there was always a conspiracy about the date of her birth, but she used to like to think that it was on the patron saint's day of artillery. Saint Barbara, is that? I'm not sure. But anyway, she always felt that she was on a battlefield. I think that comes from the tremendous discipline that she learned through her mother. She always acknowledged that she had great discipline that was taught to her by her mother. And her mother had come from a quite well-connected Greek family with captains and admirals and military people marching about and that is instilled in Maria Callas. I think one of the things that psychologically most people don't realize or certainly don't get from the books is that Maria was quite close to her father and he was a chemist. He lost all his money in the crash in America and he and his wife had left Greece because originally they had their second child was a boy and he died and that had a tremendous effect on the marriage so that when she left New York just before the war the mother had decided that the uh, marriage was obviously in, in trouble but she felt that a, a sabbatical or a change of atmosphere and going home to the old country so that her daughter Maria would meet her family um, that she was very proud of. I, I don't think um, she got frightfully well treated by them. I think they were offhand with her. And uh, she reacted accordingly. And they really got stranded there for the whole of those war years. It was in occupied Athens that Callas embarked on what she was later to call her first career. 
making her mark while still a teenager in roles like Santuzza in Cavalleria Rusticana, Fidelio and Tosca. When the war was over, she returned to America and after a period of knocking unsuccessfully on many doors, was finally auditioned for the Metropolitan Opera. The results became part of the Callas legend and showed early on just how determined and stubborn she could be. Offered two leading roles, Callas turned them both down on the grounds that they were unsuitable. She told the story in an interview with the American musicologist, Edward Downs. Uh, I was offered in America in 1946 when I came here. Mr. Johnson was then uh, uh, director. Of the Metropolitan. Of the Metropolitan, and uh, I uh, auditioned for them. I sang, I remember, I think it was Trovatore, the Damor Sulali, the first aria, and then Casta Diva. Uh, they asked me what I would sing, and I said uh, I would sing uh, Trovatore first and Casta Diva after. And I remember Johnson said, well, that's a very funny way of warming up. You should sing Casta Diva first and then Ooh. the Trovatore, Edward well, Johnson. Uh, <laughs> and I said, well, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Johnson, but I'm afraid uh, that's the way I warm up. And which is so true, it's odd. Then he offered me, I went the next day, and he offered me Fidelio in English to be oh. sung, I think, in Philadelphia. And I said, no, thank you. He says, why? I know you sing Fidelio. I said, yes, but I don't sing it in, uh, in English. Well, he says, you sang it in Greek. Well, I said, I had to because I was in Greece. But I will not sing uh, eh, Fidelio in English. It's against my principles. Well, he said, I said, offer you Butterfly. And I'm afraid I had to say no again to Butterfly because it was not uh, an ideal debut. Because uh, yeah. I think that the debut is most important. You must yes. debut in the best opera or possibly your best opera. No question. No question. So yeah. I had unfortunately had to say no. And then when I did say no, all my friends and, uh, well, you know, people around you said, well, she's crazy. Hi, hat. Who does she think she is? She'll never get another chance like that, turning down the Metropolitan and blah, blah. Well, I really knew I had to do this. And if I was asked again, I'd do it again. But I promise you, it was not easy with my own conscience after. When Callas felt that she was right, there was no moving her. And having turned down the Met, she set about looking for opportunities elsewhere. There were plans for an appearance as Turandot with a newly formed company, which fell through when the management went bankrupt days before the opening performance. But as a result of this failed venture, Callas was offered the leading role in La Gioconda at the Verona Arena in Italy, under the baton of the great Italian maestro Tullio Serafin. There she met Lord Howard, one of the most influential figures in the operatic life of Britain over the past 50 years. He was to become a lifelong friend. I was lucky. I was in Verona uh, at the Open Air Arena in August 1947, which was at the time he, she made her debut. Not actually the debut performance, but about number four. And I met her, and by one of those curious bits of luck, um, I was invited to a supper party, which she was at afterwards, and I sat next to her. It was in the open air, and she was tremendous. She was big, not vastly fat, but big. She'd sprained her ankle at the previous performance, so she was uh, found difficult in getting about and made an awful fuss about it afterwards at, at supper. Said, of course, it was very difficult. I didn't know whether I was going to be able to complete the performance. She did, of course, know she was going to complete it. She had guts. But the voice was very individual and she was very exciting already. <laughs> Thank you. 
It was during those performances of La Gioconda that Callas met the man whom two years later she was to marry. Giovanni Battista Meneghini was more than 20 years older than Callas. But there was no doubt about the attraction between them or about the increasingly important role that he came to play in her career. He was a very, very good manager and he was a tremendous bulwark against the world. I think she quite liked that. Who wouldn't? I mean, he was an absolutely first-class manager. He was a, a successful small-town businessman, not so small as all that. And I think she was very reliant on him and she was very affectionate both towards him and about him. Five years after that debut at Verona, Maria Callas appeared in England for the first time as the Druid priestess Norma in Bellini's opera. By this time, word of her extraordinary talent had spread and there were queues through the night for tickets for her debut at the Royal Opera House. Also singing a small role in the production was an up-and-coming Australian soprano who later was to make quite a name for herself in the part of Norma, Dame Joan Sutherland. La Stupenda recalls her first encounter with La Divina. The impression she made was absolutely unbelievable. I, I, I lurked behind the scenery to, so that I wouldn't miss any of, any of what I heard. Uh, she also was singing with, with Avis Dignani and the combination of those two was just magical. I, I really had a special peephole to look through and see what they were doing and thinking to myself, I wonder if I might ever sing this role. Um, she was a tireless rehearser, I remember that. She really sort of rehearsed until she felt she got things right. She also had terrible eyesight and, and at the time was not wearing contact lenses. I'm not even sure that they were a la mode then. Um, and she used to pace out how many, how many steps she could take on the stage before she needed to stop while she had her glasses on and then she would take the glasses off and, and pace again and hope she ended up in the same place. And it was, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful to see someone rehearse so professionally. The size of the voice and the fact that it coped with the coloratura, the fact that it was capable of singing incredible pianissimi, um, it, was, it was something that, that one hadn't heard before. Stignani in Norma in London in 1952, a role which she was to perform more than any other in her career. Despite huge enthusiasm for her interpretation of Norma, critics were already very divided about the basic quality of the Callas voice. Unmistakable it certainly was, but was it a great voice? Desmond Shaw Taylor described the lines of battle that were already being drawn around the Callas phenomenon. Sour, uneven, unsteady, says one faction. Shapely, grand, classical, says the other. Absurd as it may seem to admit it, both are right. The man who thinks Madame Callas a perfect vocalist has no ear. The man who fails to see that she is one of the supreme artists of our day has no taste. And I find myself equally impatient with both. How would Lord Howard describe the Callas voice? 
It was a very powerful voice, certainly when I first heard her, and indeed all the time I heard her. And it was very metallic some of the time. It was the antithesis of the kind of perfectly schooled, um, faultless, that's in a quote, <laughs> technique that many of the Canary fanciers like most, not all, but many. And people continued to find fault with the the lack of smoothness. She wasn't interested in smoothness. Oh, she was interested in legato, which is quite another thing. Uh, she was interested in, in making the music sound to its very best effect. She wanted to take risks. She was like uh, a, a horse and a rider. I remember when I was very young, an uh, intrepid horseman saying that there was no fence you couldn't get over with a fall. But you had to fall on the right side, of course. And I think she thought that somewhere, that she was prepared to take a risk take a top note, uh, even if it was a very high one, and even if there was a risk of a, of a wobble on the top. If that was what was demanded, she felt by the composer at that point, uh, she would do it. When Milanov heard her once, somebody asked Milanov about her, and Milanov was a great technician, had the most beautifully smooth technique of any grand soprano, and over a longer period, certainly any grand soprano I knew, wonderful. It was like Tebaldi Plus, if you know what I mean. Um, somebody <laughs> said... What do you think about Callas? And she said, she makes me sick to the stomach. However much criticism Callas had to face from the press or even from other performers, there's no doubt that she took her art very seriously indeed, constantly analysing and reviewing her own strengths and aware of her own shortcomings. I talk with myself frequently, Mr. Downs. And, uh, oh, yes, mainly during the evening or every now and then I just withdraw to myself and I calculate things and I say, well, this happened and that happened. The good things we forget about. Said, well, that was supposed to happen. We mm. should have done good. Yes. Now, what about the bad things? Well, let's see. How can we improve those bad things? You sound this very self-critical. Terribly, terribly. And it could uh, I could overdo it, but I prefer that with all my crises rather than just sit oh, down and enjoy course. glory because of that course. sitting down and enjoying glory means the end of a great great art. You you say you have struggled. You have struggled psychologically. You have struggled artistically. You discipline yourself. What has been a problem that has taken more of your strength than, than... Pessimism. I'm a terrible pessimist. Is that so? I think I'm incapable of doing a good job, and I try so hard to do a better job that sometimes you, you ruin things, you know. One can try you too lose hard, control, I suppose. Yes, and you lose control of... Uh, of uh, well, uh, you think you're doing nothing good, so that, in other words, that pulls down your uh, relaxation and your... Mm. That's true, I, but I isn't that part of the, of, yes. of the dynamo of what uh, makes you Yes, but any striving. exaggeration is not good. I no. realize that, but it's not always easy. Of course You see, not. I've had so much glory, and I have, that uh, my pride would want me to do even more. That's so there's no end to that. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is no end at all, but that is a marvelous thing, and that is what I meant by that is why the I feeling dislike. that, you, that yes. you, you grow. because well, That is why I dislike when critics treat me so cruelly sometimes, because I know exactly what I do. I even know what I do worse. I tear myself even more to pieces. So I dislike being told that I should do this, I should do that, when I know far only too well what I should do. Of course, so <laughs> of course. You see what a funny rebellious nature I am?
Callas warning off her enemies as Rosina in the Barber of Seville, a funny, rebellious creature indeed. One supposed enemy of Callas was the great Italian lyric soprano Renata Tebaldi, the queen of La Scala, whose smoothly beautiful style of singing was the complete opposite to Callas's approach. Their so-called feud was widely reported in the press, with Callas allegedly comparing her own voice to champagne and her rivals to Coca-Cola, but as with so many other aspects of Callas's career, the truth wasn't always as simple as what you read in the papers. Alan Seavright. Well, the history books have proved to us that it was in fact an impresario in South America that set the two ladies at one another. Earlier in the career, they'd been perfectly good friends. What I think is true is that Callas, with her hypersensitive nature, could easily be set against somebody. She was not a strong woman by personality. I believe that Renata de Baldi in many ways is stronger, but at the same time, Renata de Baldi is also a very nice woman. That's a horrid word, but I mean, she's a very uh, lovely woman to meet and a lovely artist. Callas was a very nice woman in many, many ways, but she was also a monster in other ways because she was so fragile. Behind what appears to be strength is weakness. And in Tobaldi was more, more, more retiring. At the same time, she didn't go in for cheap feuds. And the thing about Tobaldi, which shows her generosity of spirit as a woman, when Maria Callas died, I loved listening to her on a, a broadcast when she said in that lovely voice of hers, I'm going to dare to mimic her, she said, you know, I used to listen to Maria with this a bigger voice. She had this a bigger voice that she could move the coloratura, which was amazing. Tobaldi's shown a sense of humor about it in later life by saying, I suppose in the end it did Maria and I quite a lot of good. I mean, both of them at some time lands up on the cover of Time magazine and that can't be bad. But Callas made the front cover of Time magazine not simply because she was possibly the greatest opera singer in the world. More and more of the press coverage surrounding her was of a personal rather than an artistic nature. It had begun with her transformation of herself from the rather large and gauche lady that Lord Howard remembers seeing at Verona into a svelte beauty whose look and style was very much modelled on the supremely chic Audrey Hepburn. In the triumph of her famously iron willpower, Callas lost almost 30 kilos, 62 pounds, in under two years. Inevitably, people began to say that her weight loss was accompanied by a loss of power and quality in the voice. Opinion remains divided. Does Lord Howard think that there's any truth in the theory? Oh, there must be some, but I, I'm never convinced. Certainly Richard Bonning, who's no, uh, no ignoramus over voice, is as bad as expert as you can get. Um, he thinks that was so. He's convinced that was so. I've never been convinced that that was true. I've always imagined that there was, an ins uh, there was a kind of, let's use the word, flaw in her technique, and that she was so insistent on realizing her belief of the music, what she felt was in the music, which was kind of more than any other singer of my time has found in the music, any music, um, that she was therefore prepared to put her voice under strains which were abnormal and possibly unnatural. I'm never convinced that the voice loss was it. I didn't certainly, when I first heard her sing when she had slimmed, uh, the voice was beautiful and... I think that the, the fast weight loss did a lot of damage, but also she became caught up in the social round. I think that was more, more of the disaster than the losing weight. She certainly was a very big woman and um, I think had always naturally been so. I don't think one has to be as large as Callas was to sustain a, a big voice. Um, I think it's, it's somewhat of a myth and for myself I always felt better when I was a little bit slimmer than, had, than when I put on more weight. As I grew older I tended to put on more weight but um, it's, it's that much more to, to uh, carry around on the stage but <laughs> I think she lost too much too quickly and then she was sort of doing the social round, which is something I never could cope with. I really could not go to, to um, restaurants at, at night and, and feel as I could sing the next day. I, I was, was a bit groggy and felt sleepy, and I, I, I gave up going out at night, especially the night before a performance. But she was in that, that sort of social world and seemed to want it, seemed to need it. She was married, of course, to, to a much older person, a much older man, who had been a great benefactor for her at the outset. Uh, and um, I think she maybe wanted a liaison with someone younger. It's not what she ultimately had, but still, um, 
I, I, th I think she enjoyed the, the adulation and, and, and the feeling of, of being on a par with, with, with the, the, the uh, social kingpins of the day. One of those kingpins was, of course, the Greek shipping magnate Aristotle Onassis, one of the richest men in the world and as ruthless in his personal life as he was in business. Callas and her husband were invited for a cruise on Aristotle's yacht, the Christina. They were, they were not the only glamorous guests on board. Sir Winston and Lady Churchill were there, as was Giovanni Agnelli, the head of Fiat. By the time that the cruise reached Istanbul, Callas had fallen in love with the Greek tycoon, and her marriage to Meneghini was effectively over. The relationship with Onassis was the most passionate and painful of Callas's life. But she also seemed genuinely to enjoy the glitzy world of which it made her a part. When she met Onassis, she went out into the world and became a, uh, a leader, if you must use the word, of an element of cafe society. And I think she was flattered by that. She enjoyed it. Um, she was certainly very involved with Onassis and was prepared to run risks, jeopardize her career, if one must say that, um, to be with him and to go on yachts and, and go stay up late at parties, none of which she'd done before. She was tremendously careful before. I used occasionally after performances to have supper with her and she was enormously conscious of diet, of what she must eat, of not having salt, all sorts of things like that. But I think she enjoyed the, the whole thing of the fashionable world, of having Winston Churchill on the yacht uh, when she went in the, sailing in the Mediterranean with an assist. Uh, of being much photographed. I think sometimes it was, it was fairly irksome. But I think in the end, being a celebrity was often a lot of fun. She was, of course, not famous for being famous. She actually had done something very, very large to become famous. But once you've got on to that enviable or even very unenviable state, once you've got into that, um, it's very difficult to get out. And she never really did get out. Callas's operatic appearances became fewer and fewer. She seemed to spend most of her time waiting for Onassis to fly in from his latest business conquest. By renouncing her American citizenship, she had managed to have her marriage with Meneghini technically annulled. She wanted marriage with Onassis. He didn't. She wanted a child. He didn't. He had collected Callas as he might have collected an impressionist painting or a thoroughbred racehorse. But now another, even more enviable collector's item had appeared on the market. Jacqueline Kennedy, the widow of the assassinated president of the United States. In 1968, Onassis and Jackie Kennedy married. But the relationship between Onassis and Callas continued, as Alan Sievright remembers. Onassis really wanted her. Well, there's nothing more exciting to a woman or to anybody than to be chased quite like that. But there are other side effects to it that are so horrid. But I think that she did. She became eventually totally, totally seduced by this. And if he ever did love anybody, anybody who knew him says that it was her. Talk about Greek meets Greek, most certainly. It's the awful thing are things like the fact that she went on to a plane and the, the whole of the place was absolutely stuffed with flowers and then one day she said something to him, you know, you don't give me flowers anymore and he turns around and says, I don't need to because you belong to me. Um, at the same time, her friend Nadia Stanchioff, who got to know her in the last nine or ten years of her life, tells an amazing story that is so touching and later, I think in her book, Carlos remembered. Nadia was in Rome with her family um, and Maria Callas telephoned and said, Ari is coming to Paris. This is after he's truly married to Mrs. Kennedy, to Jacqueline Kennedy. And um, he's coming to Paris. He wants to take me out for dinner. Well, it's an extraordinary story. I don't think Nadia minds me telling you this tale. Um, and uh, she said, well, what are you going to do? She said, oh, well, he wants to take me to Maxime's. And, and uh, Nadia Stanchioff, who is worldly wise in the right way and a lovely woman, very special, said, you mustn't do this, Maria. Don't you realize, oh, she was like some teenage girl. I mean, he's going to have the press there. He's going to have the photograph just to, to really tear off a strip from his legal wife, the ex-president's widow. And... Um, the outcome of this was that uh, eventually she said, well, come to Rome, just don't be available. 
still hours go by and he's still going to arrive from America and she says, okay, set up a dinner party, get some friends along, make it black tie, I'll come. So Nadia was all ready to come in the room like something out of a great old Hollywood comedy, you know, like, listen here, Buster, you don't treat my girlfriend like this. You know, it really is that you expect to see those wonderful sort of Hollywood characters. And she said she watched him turn the charm on and she could actually see what this was all about. As if to compensate for Callas's comparative absence from the stage and from the concert platform, the press set about creating her in their own image. The Callas they presented to the world was almost a parody of a prima donna, a temperamental tigress, unreliable, uncharitable to colleagues, prone to cancellations. This isn't the view of people who knew her and worked with her. Dame Joan Sutherland recalls Callas's generosity on a very important occasion in her own career. I remember that when we had the dress rehearsal of Lucia de Lammermoor, um, I was very, very nervous. I, did, I wasn't very well, actually, at the time, and I was very nervous, and to, to crown it all, somebody kindly came into my dressing room and told me that Maria Callas, um, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, and Walter Legg were sitting out in the front listening to the dress rehearsal before I ever began, which didn't help my nerves at all. However, they were all very sweet and came round to the dressing room afterwards, and Maria was extremely complimentary, and remained so, actually. There was no element of temperament that we ever saw at first hand at Covent Garden while I was there. And I don't think anyone would say there was. She was meticulously prepared. She was very exacting about punctuality and about other people being prepared. She didn't at all like it if they weren't, but of course the people who sang with her at Covent Garden were prepared. She didn't like anybody being late, and I don't think they were, and they knew that she would have disliked that, and she would probably have told them. She always was helpful. On one occasion, she was going to sing Traviata in the dress rehearsal, we heard that in the following uh, group of performances, they're also Italian, the soprano had fallen ill, couldn't do it. So I swallowed twice and said I would go down and see her. And so she said, how are things going? What's happening next? So I said, what's happening? And I said that this person uh, wasn't able to sing. Would she consider, could she conceivably uh, think of singing Aida for herself? She said, what's the matter with her? I said, she's had her appendix out, I believe. I said, how did they find it? But that's not temperament. <laughs> Callas last sang in public almost 25 years ago. But of course, it's not just contemporaries and those who saw her in live performance who are admirers of La Divina. Stephen Mathers is the founder of the Callas Circle, a London-based group of Callas devotees. I didn't so much discover Callas as she crept in on me almost unawares. When I started becoming interested in opera, inevitably a callous recording came into my collection and I liked it, but it was nothing special. It was a few years later when I'd been teaching and at the end of the season we did a concert, my students gave me some record tokens and I bought a video, uh, the callous debut in Paris, and I think seeing her did something. I bought some more recordings and before I knew it, almost against my will, it wasn't a sort of blinding road to Damascus conversion, it sort of edged its way in, I became a convert. It's strange how this is always couched in religious terms. Whenever I speak to people, they say, how did you come to Callus? It's very, very strange. Um, and that was it. I was hooked. Maybe it's uh, because I'm an actor. Um, the drama appeals to me. As I say, no middle ground, love her or loathe her. Another member of the Callus circle is the actress Anna Corwin. She joined because she's been performing in a one-woman play about Callas by the French author Jean-Yves Pic and has undertaken extensive research into the woman she plays on stage. Anna has very firm views about what makes Callas such an individual, special performer. First of all, she is unique in that you, you never know where the acting stops and the singing begins and vice versa. Her acting and her singing are fused completely. You, they, they are inseparable. Secondly, in, for each part, she uses a, almost a different voice. I mean, her Gioconda voice is... You cannot compare the Gioconda voice to the Sonambula voice, for instance. You know, it's, it's, it's almost a, a different colour, a different voice, although one recognises it as her voice, instantly recognisable. My director said to me that he, when he saw her, he had the, the impression always that it was the 
one and only performance he was seeing, not just one of a string of Toscas, etc., that each one had this feeling of being unique there for you on that night and the commitment. And I think that is why, that is why she used up her voice before her time. Because she felt she had to use it fully in rehearsal in order to test herself. So she was using up her voice. In 1971, Callas came out of what had become an unofficial retirement to give a series of master classes at New York's Juilliard School of Music. Working with a young singer called Sybil Young on Rosina's aria from Rossini's Barber of Seville, she showed once again that her aim in singing was to serve the composer and his music, not to show off high notes and display. This is what happened when Young introduced a little unauthorized ornamentation into the aria. <laughs> He heard, I think, a great artist, and this is history, singing the Barbiere. And she sang it like you. And he said, oh, beautiful. Uh, what is it you are singing? <laughs> oh. And this is history. If there isn't a critic in the hall, am I right? Yeah. Mr. Lerman can testify to that. I was there. Yes, <laughs> you were there. <laughs> you were there now. <laughs> you cannot do that. Okay. I, I I no, okay. you knew better than that. No, you should have known. I, I never. Well, no. okay. No, I because if that you can see. Okay. <laughs> you have much more effect with a feeling in the voice than all that hullabaloo that goes on. Okay. <laughs> Which I detest, and I think everybody uh, thinks, whoa, what's all this about? Sure, sure, she. Wonderful display. So what? Are you after expression or are you after fireworks? The fireworks of Callas's career were almost over. In 1973, there was a world tour with the tenor Giuseppe Di Stefano. Both voices were past their prime and the planned comeback turned into a nightmare of nerves and mutual recrimination. When it was over, Maria retired to her Paris apartment. And although various projects were always under discussion, she was never to sing in public again. The baritone, Tito Gobbi, always insisted that it wasn't her voice, but her confidence that she had lost. In 1975, 
Onassis died, and Callas withdrew even more from the world and from her friends and colleagues. Alan Seawright visited her only weeks before her own death. Well, I had gone expecting to be there on that occasion for quite a short time, and she didn't want one to leave, which was very flattering, it was extremely nice, and she started to open up. I think that she were, was constantly going into forms of depression. Um, she was becoming more and more reclusive. She had actually said to um, people to Stefano on a telephone, as he told me, she said, oh, you know, every day is one day less. That's a terrible thing. She was sitting there waiting for death to come. There was this weird moment when she picked up the dogs. Uh, she adored her toy poodles. And she said how she'd always had that kind of breed. And, and if once one of them died, she replaced it with another one. And therefore, um, she felt one should be able to do that with people. But I find you can't. Now, I can't. I cannot tell you the nuance of her voice I can only feel it I can't tell you how she looked difficult to write it in a book she was always a sad woman I think if you looked into those myopic eyes of hers there was a, an inner sadness but it was it was a loneliness it was a genuine genuine loneliness that had been there from her childhood she wasn't ill. People weren't in any sense expecting her to die. And it came as a, as, a, as a terrible shock, because it came out of the blue, as it were. Maybe people, but very few people had seen her before. People who'd seen her recently may have noticed that she was um, over-reliant on, on pills, on pills to sleep with and pills to binge up again, all of which I think were perfectly legally prescribed and all that. Uh, one theory, of course, is, well, the most extreme theory is that she took too many on purpose, and other theory is that she got in a muddle over them, which is, I think, rather believable. But uh, it, was, it was a terrible shock. I was both, I admired her enormously, but I didn't expect really ever to hear her again by then, but I liked her a great deal. I thought she'd had a, a, a genuinely tragic life. I thought this wonderful achievement as a, as a, as a musical performer, not just as a singer, um, had taken her right to a summit of an area of life with which I was particularly involved and which gave me particular excitements and pleasure and so on, I thought that had had an inevitably tragic uh, ingredient with the decline after meeting Onassis, and he was the catalyst of that decline. I don't think one can see any other way. Um, and I thought that contained tragedy. And as I say, I had known her since her Italian debut. Maria Callas died in her Paris apartment on the 16th of September, 1977. She had changed the operatic world with her instinctive sense of drama, her opening up of an almost forgotten world of bel canto repertoire, but perhaps more than anything else, by the commitment and total integrity that she brought to her performances. She served music and wanted others to serve it too. These are Maria Callas' final words to her students at those Juilliard master classes. For thanks, the only thing I want you all is that you sing properly, that you apply whatever knowledge I've given to you to your spores. That's the only uh, thing I can say for the time being. Each and every one of you. It's not, it doesn't stop here. It has to keep on going, because you're supposed to follow up what, what we uh, have done, whether I keep on singing or not doesn't make any difference. You are the younger generation, and you must apply it. And that's the only thanks that I really do want. Keep on going and the proper way. Not with the uh, fireworks, not with uh, an easy applause, but with the expression of the words, with the diction and with your real feeling, whatever it is. This is what I want to say, and I'm not good at words. So, uh, that's that. <laughs> Maria Callas, La Divina. I'll leave you with Callas' performance of Eben Neandro Lontana from La Valle by Catalani. Tonight's program was produced for BBC Radio 2 by Presentable Productions. From me, Simon Callow. Good night.